All right, let uh, everybody into the uh, webinar. Uh, welcome to Powerhouse Arena's virtual events. Uh, we're live in the cloud. Uh, my name is Chris, uh, I'm the events coordinator. And tonight we're very proud to be hosting Lauren Euler and Sheila Hetty as they talk about Lauren's new book, Fake Accounts. Uh, and I'll share a link to buy a copy of the book in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can use the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and they'll take your questions at the end of the event. And I'll introduce our speakers now. Sheila Hetty is the author of eight books of fiction and nonfiction, including the novels Motherhood, How Should a Person Be, and Tickner, and the story collection The Middle Stories. She was named one of the new vanguard by the New York Times, a list of 15 women writers from around the world who are shaping the way we read and write fiction in the 21st century. Her books have been translated into 22 languages. Lauren Euler's essays on books and culture have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, London uh, Review of Books, The Guardian, New York Magazine, The Cut, The New Republic, Book Forum, and elsewhere. Born and raised in West Virginia, she now divides her time between New York and Berlin. And I'll hand it over now. Thanks. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Sheila. It's good to see you. Good to see you. You said in your last email to me that you um, cram before these? I don't cram because what would you cram? Like, I always feel like, <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, what would you cram? I'm like, I got to figure out. I got to study what I've been saying to Sheila uh, about my book so that when she asks me about it, I can like formulate it even better than I would in writing or something. Um, and I don't, I don't know. Or like study your stuff at the last, I don't, I, I don't know. It's a school. I if I'm doing the interview. No. <laughs> I know. You read your book before the interview or something. Like I know. I know. I'm like, what are the themes? I got this is my one chance to get the themes, <laughs> the real, the true themes of the book. I got to get them out there. Uh, yeah, it's always and and then you know today I was like I'm not going to drink a beer before, but then I was like oh, I want to drink a beer before, uh, and then you get over the studying. It helps you get over studying quite easily. So did you drink a beer before? No, I didn't. I feel bad. Well, good. Don't you feel like the adrenaline is good? Yes. And I always I think feel like so. a drink takes it away. Like it just cuts it down. Really? I can do yeah. like, I feel, do you ever write while drinking? No. Oh, I, I think one and a half beers is at, at 4.30 PM is the perfect level of drinking, number of drinks for writing. Okay. Maybe, I don't know, but then, after, but then after that, it like rapidly deteriorates and I'm like, I'm sleepy now and it's 7.30, so. Yeah, if I drink during the day, then I just fall asleep. Oh yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, really glad to talk to you. I was, I've been looking forward to this a lot. Me too, me too. Great. Um, yeah, so I've read in the last week, I read your book a second time. I've read all your criticism that I could find. <laughs> And all the criticism of your book. So oh, no. to talk about it. <laughs> and listen to a bunch of podcasts. I, oh no. Interesting. Yeah. Well, no, I mean I enjoy them. <laughs> I I you said I find the most torment writing book criticism. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that torment? Because you that's not the experience that the reader projects onto you as you're doing this work? Yeah, well, I think that I really want to get it. I mean, like on a very basic level, like I really want to get it right, which is to say like, I want to represent the, the novel or the essays or whatever I'm reviewing in, in the right way. Um, and I think that probably lots of uh, critics or reviewers or, or, or whatever think, I don't know, as I read more book criticism, particularly like my book, I get the sense that people don't think about, they think more about their, their perspective or like projecting their perspective or giving their opinion. And I want to, to it's not that I want to make a, a proclamation about what I think is true, but I really want to like be able to read the book and see it clearly without like being clouded by some feeling that I have or like an irritation that I have about the form or an irritation that I have about the, you know, like a preconceived notion I have about the author or something, right? So, and I think that I get very stressed out about the prospect of like, represent you know representing a book unfairly um which you know i may seem surprising because i do write the occasional negative review but i think like there's a way in which writing a positive review of a bad book is also unfair right does that make sense um 
and I think with when I was writing my book, I was like, oh, well, the only person, you know, the only person I have to answer to about this is me. Uh, so if I, it's not, you know, it's not some, someone else's book um, that is in my hands that I feel responsible for. So there's less torment in some sense because I mean it's interesting. I, I I'm kind of curious to ask you, how do you do you have a method for being able to tell what you're projecting onto the book? Um, to distinguish that from what the book is actually what the book actually is, because I feel like a lot of people don't go that farther that next step and say, okay, these feelings that the book is giving me, mm -hmm. where are they coming from? Um, I mean, I also, I think it's important to distinguish, like, so, sometimes you have a bad, you have a feeling about a book because that's what it, you know, it's supposed to do that in some way, right? Um, and, or, or you've read an author's work over the years, and then they write a book, and you, like, know their shtick, and you, that makes you quite capable of, like, identifying the shtick and criticizing it or critiquing it in whatever way. Um, but how, do I have a method? No, I think I just try to read it I try to identify like beforehand what my biases or preconceived notions might be. And also what I think the, I don't have this sort of um, superstitious thing where I don't read the reviews of books that I'm also reviewing. Like I tend to just, I, I don't feel like I need to be afraid of other people's opinions. Um, so I think that that helps a lot. And then I, I just take really careful notes that I then no, probably don't really look at again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously you read other people's criticism because you write often about their criticism in your reviews. Mm -hmm. um, there was something that you, you said, yeah, um, in another podcast, which relates to this, which is real intimacy comes from allowing another person to interpret you. And to me, this was like the key to understanding you as a critic and your novel because you're yes sometimes your reviews are negative but if they if you were just like a one of those critics that tears things up for no reason i don't think people would be as interested in reading you mm -hmm. um but if you say real intimacy comes from allowing another person to interpret you then what you are doing as a critic i think i think your reviews are a mode of intimacy because you are trying to read them as they are as closely as you're right. Not. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I think that like the, what I was thinking about with that too, was I think that now, particularly looking at Twitter or, or social media, but also just the way that the media is, I obviously have not known very many other kinds of media. I don't know if I can make a sort of historical argument that it is different, but at least now, right? Like so much of the media that I consume is, is very concise opinions and very concise sort of declarations, right? So like people will make, be making all sorts of like claims either about themselves or about other people or about politics or, or books or whatever. They're just making them very, very directly. And, and I think there's a, a way that you can get really numbed to, th that's like another way basically that, that um, distrust sort of forms because when people are constantly like making these sorts of declarations like you you know on some level not to fully trust them or to understand them as as non-objective but then when you're surrounded by that stuff it becomes like very hard to determine like what is real or true or, or whatever um so i think like if I'm writing, I don't know, a negative, if I'm writing a negative review and I'm like not taking what the writer has said at face value, but it's sort of trying to interpret it holistically and like see what they were trying to do and, and determine whether it works or not, I, I would hope that that seems kind of like, um, if not intimate per se, but, but yeah, I think intimate. I think intimate because I think I come at it from a writer's perspective, which is to say like, I understand what it means to write a book or I understand what it means to write or to want to express yourself or, or to, to want to bring together a bunch of ideas in synthesis in some way. So I think that there's like an inherent empathy in that. I don't know, whenever you've written criticism, do you feel like you like are chan, I'm not channeling, but like you understand what the, you try to understand what it means for that person to make art or something like that? 
Well, <laughs> I think what I do actually when I write criticism is like use it as an occasion to think philosophically or to think um, critically about the world beyond the book often. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really feel like I'm a true critic in the way that I see you as a critic where you say this this is not good. Like I don't think I've ever written, I would have written a review that said this is not good when I was like 20 years old and I felt so much guilt and shame and self-loathing about it that I never, I was like, I'm not gonna do that ever again because all the work this person went into it and I just had too much feeling for the person that wrote it. So I don't think I'm a critic in, 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 the, in the true sense where, um, yeah, um, like Dave Hickey, I, who I interviewed once before, he was, he was like, he says, his job is to be in the net mm -hmm. and and I feel like and 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 that's I don't feel like I feel like my job is to be in the net to the extent that I want to write about books that I want people to read but that I, I don't right. I don't I don't think that's the role of the of the critic I think the role of the critic is to be in the net yeah well I also think what you just said where you're like I felt too much like feeling for that person and felt felt bad, right? That they would feel bad, which I think is a version of what I'm saying. It's just that like, I now, I, I am like very prepared to feel bad in that way myself. So I don't want to, I don't feel like I need to protect other people from it, right? right, right. Um, and, you know, that's sort of, I've always like gone into it, like assuming or hoping that I would write a book too. So like when that happens, I understand that the, that it is fair, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's, I don't think a lot of people see it that way. And you talk about like the mutual back scratching and so on. I mean, I think a lot of people are very political in the way that they, they make these choices. So that's why your reviews are so exciting. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes I'm like, there's, I mean, there's so many opportunities for that now too. Like, I think there's like minuscule, like micro back scratching, like on Twitter now all the time, right? Like, and I get this, you know, I get the sense like people do so many <laughs> things in order to get something out of it. And, and, and that's so depressing to me and, and like alienating in a certain way. So I hope that my criticism doesn't feel like that. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said um, on like page uh, 21 of your book, um, you were talking about like writing to promote certain principles I feel are lacking in contemporary fiction. I know the eye is not your eye, it's the character's mm -hmm. eye, but can you extrapolate that to yourself? Do you write to promote certain principles? Do you write your, did you write your novel to promote certain principles you felt were lacking in contemporary fiction? And if so, what were, what are some of those principles? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, I, what, let's see, I mean, what did I have a list there? I, at one point during this draft, I had a big footnote in this, in this book that I took, I took out <laughs> sadly, um, but which expounded on this idea, like quite extensively. And it was just basically an essay uh, um, by Lauren Euler, but uh, it was like, <laughs> but I think the some of the like very basic things that I wanted to do with it were, were to like, make it feel like a novel, right? Like to do some sort of like social critique in like the form of like an old school novel. Um, and obviously there's lots of experimental stuff and it seems very contemporary in lots of ways. Um, but I wanted it to, to, to have like these pleasures that I like so much from reading like more or less old books that are sort of rare. Um, like I like long paragraphs that sort of, and like digressions that then come back and, and things like that. Um, and I also wanted to do something there. Hi, it's McKenna. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, with myself or like using myself in this sort of like auto-fictional, post-auto-fictional, I don't know what we're calling it way. Like, and like really like, I don't know, maybe you can link it to what I was saying about my criticism too, which is to like put myself out there and in this kind of like, um, daring almost daring way right and 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 see what I could do with it with myself as like a real character in the story and like as a pro as a projection of 
of whatever certain attitudes that I have. I don't know. Obviously you have said lots of very smart things about using yourself or not yourself in your books. Um, but those are some of the things. And I think really probably I was thinking about like long, long sentences to be, <laughs> to be like really basic and honest about it. Like I was like, I want to write these weird, like weird long sentences. I think about the um, criticism in the middle of the book about um, uh, aphoristic fiction, mm -hmm. let's call it, you know, the kind where there's a lot of, as you put it, like you open the book and there's no words inside. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I always think about that as like an, an and how it's like a particularly female um, mode these days, um, though historically it hasn't always been, but I always think about it as like an anorexic impulse, like mm -hmm. in some sense, is, um, and so it's interesting you talking about you liking long paragraphs and long sentences. And I think there is something about like the anorexic mode that is a partly not wanting to reveal um, mm -hmm. and not wanting to be seen and sort of wanting to disappear while at the same time wanting to appear. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I think probably something to do with control right like that the idea that you can like hone your text into some sort of like perfect like thing that only you you have control over um it, that's interesting I don't know have you ever seen sort of random discourses online where where someone will say that the way that we talk about fiction or about craft is sexist in some way because of all of these sorts of like work um like I don't know I'm trying to think of I'm now I'm sort of blanking on like a sexist word you would use to describe writing but but there is this like idea of of like clearing away everything and like only having this like pure text right which I think is total I, I don't know it just seems impossible and like something that I'm not inter interested in. like I'm not interested in having a perfect text which is like impossible anyway um and I think I sort of have this like, uh, I wouldn't say I'm definitely neurotic. I'm very neurotic, but I think that I like give up at some point and I'm like, whatever it's done, right? We were also talking about how I, how I have, how I did 250 changes between the, the, the galley and the final copy of the book. And I was like, oh yeah, that's fine. And then you were like, oh no, it must be terrible. You must feel terrible. Well, and I was I like, should I feel terrible? Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to ask you what, uh, what emotional, what, what do you want somebody to feel? Because when I finished your book and both times I finished your book, I felt a coldness around my heart like it was a very, <laughs> yeah you should apologize it was a very um, <laughs> intense feeling and I when I think about your book I feel that like it's like a cold like my heart is in a cold bath mm -hmm. and it's I just want to know yeah what did you want people did you have a sense of what you what kind of feeling you wanted people to have no, because I don't, I mean, I don't know that I thought that much about what feeling I would create, but the first people who started reading it were like, this is abhorrent and like, not because, you know, like this is not because your book is abhorrent, but like, it makes me feel very bad about um, life. Right. Uh, and I think that that, I think that that's good um, because I do... <laughs> I think that it's yeah what is the point of I think it's true I think that what I'm talking about what I'm talking about is like cruel like the way that people are cruel to each other and like and the way that people use like the banality of contemporary life like to their own ends right and the way that they can like manipulate this sort of um nihilism of the internet but also politics and and of, of having all these sort of tenuous connections and sort of manipulate that for their own aims but their aims are also sort of pathetic too right like I wanted to like represent all of that and you know not have um, a lesson at the end you know I didn't want to have a lesson I didn't want people to feel good about it. like I have a bad view <laughs> I have a negative a negative view of um not not humans but I think that people uh often you know are not 
inherently good necessarily, right? And so those are the things that I wanted to, to, to emphasize in some way in the book, because probably another thing that I think is very common in contemporary literature is to have some, have this sort of like some kind of feel good moment or something um, or, or some kind of hope, right? And I'm like, what, you know, why, <laughs> why do we, why would I put hope in there that I don't believe in? Yeah. I mean, if you don't <laughs> right. right? Uh, I understand that people want that, but that's like not my role. To, no. To, well, you know. okay. Here's a question then. Um, because I felt, I feel like, so in, in some sense, you, you know, this is a critique of like a contemporary way of being, um, you know, that is um, inflected by all the time that we spend online and on social media. And you know, I, I, I see your novel as a novel and I also see it as a critic's novel. And as you said yourself, you wanted to do like social critique in the novel. And there's so much in the novel. Some of the best parts I think are sentences that one could have found in your reviews. Like you are, it seems to me it's you in many cases, though it doesn't matter to me whether it's you or not yeah. you, talking about the world and in yeah. often incredibly funny ways. <laughs> um, but I, so my question for you, um, which is the, the question that, this is what I think I, was there, did this, did your, did this, the idea of the subconscious or the unconscious, like have any participation in your creation of this book or was it written with the part that like the, exclusively the same part of your mind that you employ to write your criticism hmm. or was there like this weird, you know, a weirdness that sort of came in and overturned things ever um yeah I mean I well, that's an interesting question did my well how involved was my subconscious I mean I think there's definitely I think particularly in the like weird experimental things like those felt very innate to me and then when I was sort of writing it just happened like the the aphoristic thing like just it came to me and I just wrote it right then um or some of the like I think the ex-boyfriend chorus also like really just it came to me. I don't know if that counts. Are you wearing a hundred bracelets? What? Are you wearing a hundred bracelets? No, I'm just wearing one bracelet. It, does it sound clinky? Oh, I'm clicking my pen. Sorry. Nervous. Oh, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Oh yeah. Sorry. No, I'm clicking my pen. Okay. I'll stop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my subconscious. I mean, of course, I think, okay. I mean, really yeah. my, my belief and this is why criticism can be very intimate and, and also why people get very hurt by it and why critics can feel sort of empowered to be sort of cruel and like make these sort of kind of at times inappropriately personal critiques of, of books, right? Because there is like something about you that is in it, right? There's, there's something, I do believe like something true about you can be gleaned from your books that you write and any novelist, even a novelist who is apparently not in their books at all, like in a literal way, um, is very much in them. Um, but in terms of like putting in critiques of the world or something, right? I think it was, I wanted to be able to describe social situations and situations that had no sort of like obvious object in an essay and would be kind of inappropriate at, at probably to, to write about in an essay, right? Like if somebody is mean to you on Twitter, you can't, I mean, you could write an essay about it, but it would be like a weird inappropriate essay, but it has all these meanings and all of these implications that um, are oh, interesting the question, the right? No, the question was the unconscious that, and like the subconscious. Like, do you think, right. and I think that is like an interesting answer when you said the ex-boyfriends, because to me, that was one of the weirdest and most delightful <laughs> elements of the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, is that where your subconscious is? I don't know, right? Like I do, I think I probably resist. Yourself. It's when you surprise yourself. Like, yeah. And, and I think you don't know where it came from. Yes, and I think that there's like a lot of, Though I will say like whenever I dream, my dreams are always extremely literal and it's always like, <laughs> I, I, wor I worried that um, an editor was gonna dump, you know, like an editor was not gonna take my article or they're always just so, so boring. Yeah. So maybe my subconscious is like closer to my my front yeah. of mind than, than for other people. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I think I think definitely. And also the the sort of like overall sense of like someone who 
<laughs> wants to be seen in some way, right? Like I think as I think the narrator does, but doesn't want to be seen in, in in a negative, in a bad way at all. And also doesn't really want to be seen like um, in a, you know, through a fault in a false way, right? Like I think she re rejects things on two sides. Like she's very resistant to being truly known like in an earnest way, but she's also very resistant to being like viewed through these sort of like pop culture, psychological, like pop psychology. Like her friends are like, you need to go to therapy so that we don't have to talk to you anymore. And she very much <laughs> resists that as well. Um, so I think probably that is not necessarily something I was going for initially, we can say. <laughs> Do you feel like you're, um, when you write criticism, you are, I assume that a lot of the reviews that you were writing, you were writing while you were writing this book, like the Kristen mm -hmm. McKinnon and Catherine Lacey and maybe John Ray, like were those reviews written while you were writing your book? Yeah, let's see. I wrote the book for the beginning of 2017 through the middle of 2018. So pretty much like anything that came out in that period of time. Um, so when I reviewed your book, I, it was, I was right. I had, was working on mine, I think, I think, yeah, like I almost finished mine probably. Um, okay. So my, my question is like, I found it interesting reading some of your reviews that the description descriptions of some of these books could map onto your book right which I, and it's this is not a criticism it's just like i feel like i i feel like i do this when i write book criticism that i finish the piece and then i think oh in some way i was also writing about whatever book i'm working on or i'm writing about myself like um with kristen repentance you say um the book's fatalism, whatever, sends the reader on a hunt for motivation or meaning only to have her end up right where she started, a story about selfish people messing with other people for selfish reasons or no reason at all, which is a very good description of your book, I think. Yeah, thank you. And yeah. I have other, like John Ray, the extent of John Ray's foreshadowing, which touches most aspects of the novel's plot, makes the ending feel like it's a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. um and then the K Catherine Lacey you talk that about that one I wouldn't have noticed I wouldn't have noticed that the John Ray one <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously the Catherine Lacey one uh the answers her book the answers you talk um you says it you say it belongs to a cohort of female anti-protagonists -pro devoid of personality and interest though I think you're character does have personality, though I don't know if she has interests. They are not so much characters as devices through which the author can funnel observations about modern life. And then you talk also about Rachel Cusk and Katie Kitamura, and you say that all these books, um, they're, um, they have a series of characters who have our attention and don't really know what to do with it. They definitely examine the effects of fame, trauma, heterosexuality, social media, and technology on women, only to conclude, now what? And so I feel like all these are in some ways also reflections back on the book you're writing. And I wonder if you have felt that, like when you write criticism, that in some way you're also writing about your own work that you're working on. Yeah, well, I think not literally, but I think that one naturally, and you can see this, I think, too, when you're reading other critics, you read critics over time or whatever, or you read a novelist who then does criticism, I think that their frameworks, whatever frameworks that they're using naturally come through. And so it might not be like on, you know, I don't think it's on purpose. Like I'm going to like use this thing, but it's, it's an issue that I thought about because I was working on my own book and therefore I will like, you know, apply it to, to these works. Right. Um, and I think that the, the, basically like I feel like I develop an understand an understanding of the books and the problems that they have and the problems that they you know that the authors maybe like don't care about because they have their own frameworks right but like these problems that I'm identifying I'm like those are the problems that I was aware of when I'm writing my book how do I add now what like now what something else what's you know what's the what's what is you know what's more or or where, what am I going to do with it and I think that for all of the, you know, for all of the, we all are writing at the same time, right? So we're all like dealing with certain similar inputs or, or whatever. And how, how we like the differences are, I think what's important, right? Um, but yeah, I think it's because I, I'm like, I understand what, I, I see what you're doing. I understand what you're doing, like how you've done it and why you've done it this way, but like what, else or what next right yeah 
um how long does it take you to write a book review because I feel like when oh I write book reviews they take me so long it's on, <laughs> I, I feel like it's not worth it like how much time I put into it it's definitely not worth it. It's definitely not worth it. Um, it takes, I have no idea how long it takes. It takes like a horrible amount of time because you read the book and then you probably read it again. Yeah. I'll probably not read it again if I'm writing a really positive review because it's just like, I'm like, gonna say, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be called out on it. Um, but it takes, it takes forever. And yeah. <laughs> I also have this, like, as I said, like a torment period where I am like, putting it off because I'm afraid it's going to go terribly or I'm going to like get it wrong or something or like I'm going to like I don't know I'm just going to reveal some like horrible like hole in my thinking and my like interpretation of the book that's going to be ruinous um but also I just procrastinate a lot and I find writing like I don't know daunting so that's probably it um I kind of believe I don't in procrastination know. like I think that you need urgency to write mm -hmm. Yeah, but I miss my deadlines. Oh. <laughs> like very, like pretty, like almost exclusively. I really? very rarely need a deadline. Really? I feel like I'm like the most productive you can be while still being very late. So when do you, okay, so you got your deadline like December 1st. What happens? Like, where are you November 15th? Where are you December 15th? I might, I'm, I, it I mean, it depends, but I might think like, I, I will have definitely read the book by December 1st. Oh my God, I hope so. <laughs> but I'll probably like, I don't know. I do, I do, you know, like when you leave the house at the time that you're supposed to be there. And so you're starting to write it on December 1st and you wrote, you write your editor like November 31st and you say, I'm going to be late or do you write them? Yeah, I usually write them. The time. <laughs> yeah, I usually write them. It depends on the, it's also just depends on the magazine. I have this like very bad, like I know, what it's like to work at a website. Like I understand, you know, if I'm writing for the New York Times Magazine, which I'm not writing book reviews for them, but like they're on a week, a tight weekly schedule. So yeah. if I understand that I don't really have a lot of room, but if I am writing for a website, then I'm like, you don't know when it's gonna go. <laughs> you don't know when it's gonna go up. Um, and I think too, like I read the editors emails asking for it like I interpret them quite aggressively so I understand like when they actually want the article this is a day I sound ter totally terrible um but I'm just surprised I would have I thought that you were I freak out too and I like take lots of notes and then I just like don't I don't know I have to have the beginning before I can like write the rest pretty much like otherwise it's very disparate but my word docs are chaotic and have like random lines and then like thing I, you can probably tell reading the, my articles which are not like highly structural like you know perfect I don't think that when I, read these, <laughs> I feel like they're well argued and well structured um okay here changing subjects um <laughs> you say um I think this was in the novel but it could have been somewhere else um there seem to be two options for engaging with the world desperate close reading or planned obsolescence. Okay, I wanna ask you about planned obsolescence. And was this from the novel? Yes. Okay. Is not being on Twitter or social media for a human, a contemporary human who's interested in culture, planned obsolescence? That's a good question. Uh, so the- Of the self? The, no, it's good. I mean, that's good. Uh, the- the part, the scene that that comes from, she's, the narrator is like talking to her friend or not her friend, an acquaintance that she has met in Berlin, who is like quite disarmingly like nice, but kind of stupid as well. Um, but she's really nice. And like often she has started like a writing group and the two of them are supposed to exchange writing, but the only person who ever brings writing is the girl and the narrator just never brings any writing. Um, and they're talking, they're having coffee or something. And and the the girl is like, I've actually stopped reading the news uh, and this is taking place like maybe in May, May of 2017. So to do this I had a very, there was a very heightened, um, like horrific idea that you would stop reading the news and everybody sort of probably wanted to, but, but felt that it was their moral obligation to read the news. Um, and the narrator is like, well, actually, 
why not? Like what good is being done by me knowing what's happening in the world? Like I'm not doing anything with it. Who, you know, who cares? Someone will, someone will probably tell you if like there's a horrible tornado, you know, there's a horrible storm coming or something, right? Like, because, because probably you've also been bragging about not reading the news. So, so everybody knows that you are. Um, but do, do I think not being on Twitter? I mean, there is a certain, there is a certain way in which I think, yes, not probably not being on Twitter is planned obsolescence and it's not going to come for you now, probably, <laughs> but I think like in the future, it's hard. I mean, it's just hard, but, but you see things happen on Twitter and the people who are on it are like in general, quite powerful people in the media, quite powerful people in politics, like because of the way that the world works, the people who are on it, there's not that many of them, but, but they have like a sort of outsized importance. And I think you can watch as ideas where they come from on Twitter and sort of migrate into the offline world. And like AOC will be saying something that like clearly comes from someone writing an article and the person who's written the article like what is popular on Twitter and they disseminated it online, right? Like it's the, the way that people are getting their media is just bound up in Twitter. And I think that that sucks. Um, but also, I mean, if, even if you're just thinking like culturally and you're sort of bound up in like the literary scene or, or I don't know about any other scenes, but the literary scene, certainly, I think that people develop their like classic old school grudges and like classic, like just in the way in the past, like you would insult someone in a book review and then see them at a party. But now it's like, you can see them insulting you just in public, you know, you can just watch them do it. And then you might have to interact with them in some other way later. And then you, I can't imagine like not wanting to know that someone has insulted me if I'm going to have to do business with them in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, but it also doesn't make sense because what are you going to do with that information anyway? I, who knows? I don't know. I mean, the thing is like, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's, it's, this is definitely where my like negative opinion of people comes from. And it's from watching them like do mean, like self obsessed, like narcissistic, like grandstanding, but also just like petty things all day. Right. And it's kind of amazing. I mean, the thing is that I get, I get like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's amazing to watch. But then couldn't, couldn't the planned obsolescence also be being on social media all the time to the extent that you actually lose some of the self that is necessary to maintain in order to be the kind of person who would critique the culture intelligently? Like, I don't know, planned obsolescence seems to me could go both ways because if you're talking about being on social media and you develop a voice, which is mm -hmm. the voice of social media, like, or the voice of Twitter, let's say, and that becomes your voice, that's also a planned obsolescence because that voice is also going to become obsolete. Yeah. It may, it'll evolve, but it also, but where does your voice go? Yeah, it's but do you think that there's like an, I mean, how much of an essential self is there really? Like if you're not getting it from Twitter, you're getting it from your family or from the books that you read or the TV that you watch or, or something like yeah, that. Right. And I think rather have it from a constellation of unique sources rather than a constellation of like more shared sources. Wouldn't yeah. I mean, I obviously like that? don't want my sense of self to come from Twitter. I think. Or your voice. Let's just say right, your voice. Yeah, totally not. Um, but I also don't know that the Twitter voice is like so unique to Twitter, right? Like I sort of believe that there, there are a bunch of different kinds of voices on Twitter. And maybe this is just because I like am very familiar with it, but I think like there are, it's not just the collective voice. No, 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 you, you, you can say point. that, right. Yeah. But I think that there's like all sorts of types of but, but the issue, I think. To, you're still talking to many people at once, which 
seemed to require a persona more than if you're talking, if you make a habit and practice of exclusively talking to one person at a time, let's just say like, don't you think that there's a difference in, in what happens to yourself if you're talking always to you don't know who and you're trying to, isn't that more projecting than relational? Like yeah, but what, I mean, I know that there's a difference, but what you just said is seems to me no different than a novel, right? Like I'm talking to a bunch of people at once and a lot of them are not. But you're not talking to, like you're making something, you're making an object, you're making like a work of art that's gonna like not change. That seems hmm. so different. That's not, to me, that's not talking to a bunch of people at once. Really? It's talking to a bunch of people at once throughout time. That's even like more, but also I- <laughs> talking to people I think it's like you're making you're making something that people will interpret and like have a relationship to but I, you're not talking to them because it's the book that is talking like it's not you right but you made it yeah but it is you because you made it it's not you necessarily it's not literally you right like it's like no, not, but you're not the narrator but like from talking to somebody mm, sure but I think my conception of the book is, particularly this book, is to talk is talking to somebody. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and that's what's really interesting. I mean, that's why it's like so. With the first time I read it, I just simply couldn't stop reading it because you yeah. do have this feeling of like what you say in different interviews, like you're relaying the gossip, right? Like yeah. there's a sense of what well, I'm telling a story to you, um, which is very gripping. Yeah, and I think like people have had that. In the, in the past, right? And I think like, I enjoy, I enjoy it and I find it interesting. And I think like, I don't know, I, I guess I just don't think of the of my book, my writing as like, uh, it necessarily has an audience because if I didn't want it to have an audience then I probably just wouldn't do, I would write in a journal or something, right? Like I would do something else. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I also write books for people to read them, but yeah. I, I don't see that at all the same as like talking on Twitter. No, I don't see, I mean, I don't see it the same as talking on Twitter. I just see it like structurally as not so different, right? And I think on Twitter too, like something that I have been thinking more about is like the way that, I mean, this is very obvious, right? Like you have a bubble, it seems like everybody has the same consensus and then you just sort of shift your perspective a little bit. Like somehow you, I don't know, one time I got retweeted by like a right-wing guy and all these like weird, like you can't even really read what they're talking about, right? Like they're talking to you and you're like, I am like, I have no idea what you're <laughs> saying. And I think that there's this like very compelling thing for me about it, which is that like, oh, I feel like everyone is saying this, but actually there are plenty of other groups of people who also feel like everyone is saying the same thing, but actually there's just like iterations of groups of people that go on and it might as well be more or less forever, um, which is kind of freeing in a way. Um, but yeah, I think I resist the idea that, that of, of course, talking on Twitter is a thing, is a thing, right? I can't, I've lost the original question. Okay, let me, let, me, let me switch it slightly because I want yeah. to get in something that you talk, well, you talk in the book about um, loving um, Harriet the Spy or not you, yeah. but whatever, like we're talking about Harriet the Spy, um, which, which is a great book. Um, and where is it? It's sort of like in the middle. I, th I think it might be the vibe I'm feeling is like, <laughs> oh yeah, your question. Um, okay, yeah. So she, so this character, the protagonist remembers herself as a young girl, quote, sitting on the floor of my closet, fascinating myself with ideas I couldn't believe I was having. The person I became once I started to explain myself, the voice that emerged from thoughts and feelings. So the voice emerges from her thoughts and feelings. But mm -hmm. now, quote, I would try to become the inverse, a person whose voice determined her thoughts and feelings, whose thoughts and feelings you could only figure out by interpreting her voice, and even then you could be wrong. So that's yes. sort of like, that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes, and I think that that's, I mean, obviously I wrote it, so I think that it's a <laughs> good <laughs> idea, but, but I think that that's like the correct, because they both do have like a, you both in both experiences when you're tweeting or when you're writing a novel or, or writing, you know, more serious, whatever it is you're writing. Um, 
there is like a relationship between your thoughts and your, your voice. Right. But when you are trying to like cultivate this persona, it just becomes more and more about the voice. But, but now that we're having this conversation, I'm like, well, what, it, I mean, a voice has like qualities itself too, right? Like it's not just, you know, it, it emerges from, from some sort of pressure or from some sort of thing. And, and one of the, the elements creating the voice would be like you, how are you responding to this collective context, right? And it, I think some people are uh, like more original on Twitter than others, obviously. And then others are, you know, people are just copying the, you know, the idiom. But I think in the worst, I think probably to say like the worst instances are people who are just like doing the voice and purporting. I think what disturbs me about it a lot is like they're purporting to be saying something really real about themselves and to be like expressing themselves. And they are, but it's not the thing that they're literally saying, right? Like it is, you have to interpret the context. You have to interpret what they're saying, like within the context and within probably the things that they've said in the past, right? Um, and that's a way that it can become kind of conspiratorial, but also I think can become kind of like a novel. <laughs> uh, if you want to think of people who are on Twitter as characters. Um, you seem disturbed by this. <laughs> no, I'm just like, I'm not disturbed by this. I, I okay, I, I, I wanted to break, this is a good time to bring it in one of the critiques that somebody had of your book that I, that relates to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'd like, did you respond to it? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so this is from volume one, Brooklyn, Jared Michael Pollan. He says, okay. a commitment to showcasing a narrator's self-consciousness this entirely, a commitment to showcasing a narrator's self-consciousness this entirely leaves little room for dramatic irony. Readers need to be able to see around a character in order for tension to develop between them and the actuality of their world. But here, our narrator's self-consciousness is so monopolizing that almost nothing goes untouched by it, and we rarely feel like we know something she doesn't. I thought that was really interesting, and um, it's true that you can't see around the character, which was right. This, I don't think I've had that. I'm trying to think of like other books where I had that experience, and what does it do not to be able to see around the character because? Not only is she like completely narr is it is she narrating her own um, consciousness and anticipating and sort of deflecting what the reader might think, but there's something else that prevents the looking around of the care looking behind the character. What is that? I think it's probably the character, right? Like she doesn't want you I think it's number one it's very basic like I think it's the character because she doesn't want to and number two I think that it's the fact and this is going to sound very basic I think it's the fact that she's telling the story retroactively and I really thought like how would she be telling the story it's taking place in the past she's talking to you and she knows the end of the story but at the time she didn't right so she needs to convey that she didn't know and she wants you to be surprised by it in some way right what has happened to her right if you think of if you think of the plot you can imagine someone being like oh my god you will never believe what happened that you know you know how felix died in a bicycle accident you know blah 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 um and i think because she has this like she does really like control the story and i i at least thought of it as like you know to be honest, I didn't really think about her as seeming particularly self-conscious or particularly like in control until the end, probably, because I was thinking more realistically, like, how would I convey this mood or this, how, you know, how would I tell the story in this particular way? Um, but I think, I don't know. I mean, do you think you can't see around the character at all? Do you, do you, do you think that her? Yeah, there's something about the voice where something about the voice or something about the narrative or something about it. I don't, I can't put my finger on it where you can't see behind her. Yeah. Which is a weird thing to say, but I think this, this is a sense of like leaving a little room for dramatic irony. 
like right well I think too something that I think about a lot and I think probably there's like a little line a throwaway line somewhere in the book where she's like my friends had dated these crew like my friend met a guy at a Balkan Beats concert and then she dated him for six months or whatever I can't remember what she's but she's like I had no I could not fathom that kind of decision and actually like she is making lots of decisions that the people around her can't really fathom right and in part it's because she has the secret which is that her boyfriend is like a secret conspiracy theorist and she's kind of embarrassed about it but in part it's because she doesn't want to be like she doesn't want to admit even though everyone sort of knows right like she knows and everybody else knows like why she's doing the things that she's doing right but she doesn't want to admit it and i was interested in this like kind of person who's like making a bad decision but it's a kind of like low level bad decision and you're like I can see why you're doing that and you should probably not do it, but, but it doesn't really matter if you don't, if you do it or not. Right. And it, there's all this sort of like, I don't know, life now feels often that it has such low stakes. <laughs> and, and I think part of what, what she's doing is like trying to create some kind of stakes and she fails. Right. Um, yeah. But that relates to, I think, to this general idea, which I really disagree with, which is that fiction writers are not supposed to be very smart. Yeah, you talk about this in your review, <laughs> and you impugn me. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you say, you mention myself and Ben Lerner and Taolin as three intelligent writers who have strategies for deflecting intelligence. And you say, um, in Ben Lerner's case, it's self-conscious, what, humor? Um, Self-deprecation, yeah self-deprecating humor and in my case uh, a naivety and I can't remember what you say in Talon's case but then you say Helen DeWitt is one of the only writers that doesn't that showcases her um, intelligence without any sort of um, deflection and you know you talk, do you know a book called The Hatred of Literature? Yes I haven't it read it though. It recently came out a few years yeah. ago it's really interesting but it it makes a similar point to what you're talking about which is that well, you're saying that people hate intelligence and it's saying that people hate literature. I mean, it's the same. <laughs> yeah. The same thing. yeah. Well, they want this like book, they want this like book, right? Like that, that seems like it has emerged from your soul. Right. And they don't want to admit that it is something that you, you thought about and that you made because that's well, thre threatening. Not incompatible. What? Well, the, those things are not incompatible. No, of course not. Um, like it can emerge from your soul and also be something you thought about and made. Yeah, absolutely. But I also think that there's like a like a relationship between those two things, right? Like, what do you think the relationship is? I don't know. What do you think the relationship is? I just read your essay about um, Bernard and and you talk about like the inspiration and what it, what do you do when the inspiration goes away, but you still have to sort of like over time you still have to work at the, on the thing that you're working on, and. Um, I mean, I think it's very interesting, but is inspiration coming from your soul? I think you can probably like make a deflate, I'm not going to do it, but I think you could probably make a very deflating argument about like where inspiration comes from. And you could probably like point to like three or four different things and be like, oh, that's why I had that idea. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's sort of like- You are, it comes from, di it comes from different places, right? Yeah. Depending on what- Yeah your inspiration comes from different places from mine and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think, I don't know. I always like to read, uh, like, I, I, I don't know. I guess it's back to what you're, what, what you're saying, which is true, which is like, I think many readers and including like book critics, like don't want you to be smart. And I think you can see that in your reviews too, which is that like, they don't want to admit that you have like done something with your narrator, right? Like they want to just say that it's you because it is uncomfortable to admit that you would use yourself as part of this alchemy or whatever in order to make something new and to well, create like, a, what? Because you said like, I you when you reviewed the reviews of motherhood, I would think more than reviewing motherhood, which I, I really appreciate. You reviewed the bad reviews of motherhood and critiqued them. And you, <laughs> you said that bad. I get more I suffer more from the conflation of myself with my narrator than other writers of yeah. called autofiction. And I, I want to ask you, what do you think that is due to besides being a female writer? I don't know. I think it's because you like, 
I think it's like in part because you don't have a lot of like filler in the book and it's it's not the same as like what we were talking about earlier which is to say like excess but it's that you like talk about experiences in this very sort of pure way and there's like not it's not like Ben Lerner okay Ben Lerner is a good example counter example right number one he's a man okay but or we could talk about Jenny Offal where where nobody seems to make this like like uh criticism of her that it's that it's auto that it's autobiographical and she is her narrator even though if you think about it for a second you're like it, you know what why Sheila and not Jenny Offal um and I think it's because you have this like in this I don't know you come to the world in a very sort of like direct way and you try and read it in a very sort of like not pure but like un unapolog like I don't know you don't you don't set up things in <laughs> in a in order to talk about them does that make sense I don't know um but what so when too self -indulgent? So, what I don't no know. you're not self-indulgent no I think it's an interesting question because I think about this a lot and I was thinking about another book recently that like but other, yeah some I some, just took like an arbitrary what is the reason why some people get sort of like criticized for being their narrator and other people are like oh well it's just an autobiographical novel and yeah. it's because you're 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 speaking like in a more esso essayistic voice maybe but in in a the thing about it is that you speak in a very different voice in your essays than you do in your novels. Yeah, and I felt kind of, you know, after I published How Should a Person Be, I started writing for the LRB. And part of the reason I wanted to write those reviews was specifically for that, to create that contrast, to be like, this is actually the voice of How Should a Person Be is not my voice, it's a character. Right. Uh, these essays, I hope, would prove that. Right. It's like a projection or a persona or like a, you know, it's a, it's something, it's something out. You're adding something. I don't know. It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. Cause obviously like the character in my book is terrible. <laughs> she's not, she's like, not, I would never say those, a lot of those things. I liked right? in the interview where somebody said, you know, this unlikable character and you were like, she's not unlikable. She's immoral. Yeah. Or even amoral. Right. Like she, yeah, I, I don't know. I what I sure, but I think <laughs> kind of all. But they kind of both are. I mean, I yeah. That if you consider like flat out lying to people that you supposedly love, then yeah. And but she is. I think she's like kind of charming, right? Like that's why you want to you want to read the book because she's very. I I interviewed um, Phoebe Waller Bridge a few years ago, and everybody was saying the same thing to her. They were saying that like. Fleabag's so unlikable and I was like do you think Fleabag's unlikable I think she's insanely likable that's like the real problem <laughs> that's the problem that she has um and but yeah it I think but I you're see, I see no. it kind of like a horror a horror novel yeah. because I think it is actually an exaggeration of the world in in the and and it's an exaggeration of the things that we all but I think you in particular going back to this like criticism and intimacy, intimacy thing we were talking about earlier that you in particular feel the most despair about. Mm -hmm. And you're creating a world where there's no out and there's nothing to be found alone. There's nothing to be found online and there's nothing to be found with other people. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I could <laughs> put, I don't know. I'm like, should I have put like, like release valves in there? I don't know. I don't know. I think of no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I think looking at it, I, no, I mean, I, what would a release valve have been? I don't know. I see it, her learning German as like a good step, <laughs> <laughs> but, but she has a bad attitude about it, even though she's like making the effort to do something that's kind of embarrassing and, um, as part of this sort of like planned obsolescence thing, right? Like she doesn't need to learn German in any way. Um, you're not ever going to have to speak it, but, but it's good to do because it allows you to sort of connect with people on like a bit, very basic level. Um, but she's proud about it anyway. Uh, so I see that as kind of like a happy, a happy ending. And I think maybe she has like a nice relationship with her roommate in the end. They have a really fun night where they drink wine after she, the, the twist is revealed and she and her roommate have like a night. And 
what do I, I think I have her say, like, I learned a lot about her, but she doesn't say what it is. <laughs> and that's, because, you know, it's, which is like a fun, you know, it's like sort of fun, but what I do it because I think like part of the release valve is not revealing all the things that you know, which is, or all the things that you're thinking, right? Like it becomes, it becomes nice to have, not have all the information. Um, I think we have to wrap up, but I want to ask you one last question, which is why do you think so many, why do you think there's a hard time, people have a hard time conceptualizing the critic, like the serious book critic and the novelist in one person? I think that they think that they are like, I think that they think that they're inherently at odds and that the critic is like the enemy of the artist, right? And I think part, it partly has to do with what we were talking about earlier, which is that they think that the artist has to be kind of dumb. Like they think that the artist can't, if you have too many thoughts, then your genius will get stuck on them and you won't be able to go forward. Uh, so I think that probably those, those are the reasons, but, um, I mean, I was just reading The Critic as Artist by Oscar Wilde and he, you know, he's like, well, the critical impulse to like, I can't remember the, the nice clothes that's in there, but like the artist who is cutting away so much stuff, that's the same, the same impulse is like a critical impulse to sort of like omit or, or to, to think of things in negative terms so that something positive comes through. Um, so I don't think that they're necessarily at odds. I think there are some critics probably who wouldn't write very good novels or, you know, it's interesting mostly, it's the most interesting in the book world, right? Because it's the same, it feels like the same thing because you're both writing. Whereas like, if you're an art critic, right. you just might be a bad painter and that, that is totally different. Um, so I think that people get like, Un, you know, unduly obsessed with the differences. But I think that all novels are critical in some way or have a critique in them, like any, you know, anything. And as you were saying earlier, all book reviews have a fictional, the element, the projection of the reader onto the, yeah. Yeah. The, the projection of the critic onto the book itself, making the book in their own image in some sense. Yeah, or how would, it, I think a bad review is like, how would I have written this, yeah. right? Like, and, and that's not what you should do because it's cruel. Um, should I take, should we take a couple questions? It's eight on three or should we just- It's only, I mean, it's only if you see any that are, it's up to you. I don't know what powerhouse believes. We could do one in interest of fairness. Okay, okay. Uh, Lauren Billow, you are both such funny writers, but also very interested in ideas. People sometimes express humor as separate from the ideas in writing, but I think they're connected. What does being funny have to do with the ideas you want to express? Or what would be lost if you express similar ideas without being funny? That's a great question. Um, now I'm like, do you want to go first? Um, I think <laughs> that, that it's just, if you're trying to represent life, like life is very funny, people are very funny. Um, despite my horror novel, I think that there are lots of, you know, there are lots of things to enjoy in life. And if you're trying to, ex if you're trying to say something true, it, it just is often going to be very funny. Um, and I think too, like I do think of the reader and I want the reader to have a good time with my writing. Like, I don't want them to feel like it's a chore. I don't want them to, you know, I, cause I'm not, you know, I'm not like, a, a scholar. Yeah, I'm not teaching you it very much with my work, right? You're reading it for some other reason. So I don't need you to feel like it's like a, you know, a slog. What do you think? Your books are very funny too, but in a very, I think in a very different way that is very unique to you. I just think that that's part of experiencing the world is experiencing the humor. Um, and so why wouldn't it go into the book? I mean, I love, I love when books, I don't, I can't think of a book I love where there isn't, that the writer doesn't have just in their outlook humor um, yeah. as part of it. It just doesn't exist. There's no worldview that anyone would want to get close to that has 
no humor and it's you know right I agree. ingredients yeah and I think it it just it ends up like you're saying like, sort of what you're saying but it ends up feeling false somehow or like you're just missing something that's really key to life yeah and I think I mean I haven't read yeah. I haven't read that much about humor or like the theory of humor or, or, or anything, but I think too, like there is something sort of vulnerable about making a joke. Right. And if the, you have a text that has no jokes in it, there's something that feels like the writer is trying to like trick, not trick you, but, or, but just trying to like, be too much in control, right? Like there's something about jokes that are very spontaneous and, and that that reveals something about the person who's telling them that is not in like unfunny, serious writing, over serious writing. Um, so I wonder if that that's part of our like resistance to that it just, se it just seems like they're, someone who's not willing to make a joke is not willing to be, um, fully, you know, in the world and fully, fully vulnerable for lack of a better word. Yeah, maybe so. Um, there's so much that we <laughs> get to, but um, there's so much more to get to. Um, I, sorry, I'm going to ask my one last question very quickly and you can answer it very quickly, but, or, fa or slowly, but really just talking about vulnerable people's there's been a number of criticisms of your book that there, it's not vulnerable enough mm -hmm. um the new republic perhaps the next generation of novels can move past the self-conscious self-awareness past the ironic distance and find a way to be witty, witty while also being vulnerable and then somebody else in the new statesman it's easy to be a scornful smart ass a call out stage it takes a lot more courage to be vulnerable and sincere last but not least what do you make of this, this? well i think that they you know I think that they didn't read it very carefully because I think that there's there I I would never have even thought about this while I was writing, but there are times when I'm writing my even my criticism where I'm like this is too sentimental and you need to roll it back but keep the sentimental you know keep something you know vulnerable I don't what's a what's a better word for that I would just never think of it as, in terms of vulnerability or not but like something that is like real feeling in some way. Um, and I think that in the, in the book, like she's criticizing a lot of stuff, but also she's like, I don't, you know, I had to control F and take out the word embarrassing, humiliating and shame, like shame so many times. And there's still tons of instances of her, like being very embarrassed and then passing through it. Right. And then like there are instances where she's crying or she's like very upset about an interaction that she's had. And then she like has, you know, gets over it. Right. And I think that like, in life when something like bad happens to us that we feel bad about or something good happens to us that we feel good you know that makes us very happy and joy can be a vulnerable emotion as well it doesn't like have a great there's not an epiphany that comes with it right like there's not like a you can't write an essay about every moment of, of badness or goodness that happens in your life it just sort of passes and then you have to live the next day and the the overall situation remains in whatever way and I, I thought that that was like a more realistic portrayal of of you know like pain um, or alienation or, or whatever in the book than having these sort of like I don't know you read a novel sometimes where there's always these like horrible epiphanies and there's something that you take away from it and I think probably like life doesn't work like that unfortunately or fortunately i don't know i think it's probably quite exhausting to be having huge moments emotional moments all the time right i don't know that it would fun things would function very well no probably not <laughs> <laughs> um well i so much enjoy talking to you and yeah, this has yeah. been so great. Thank you for, thank you for reading all my stuff. That's very, it's, you know, <laughs> excessive probably. Well, thank you for reading. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you contribute a lot to the, the world of, um, 
uh, literature. And uh, I, I, I really, really appreciate your book and your criticism is, um, as well. I, I take a lot of pleasure in it. And I love your stuff too, of course, as <laughs> you know. <laughs> thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I agree. <laughs> this is a great talk. <laughs> Here's some of the deepest thinking about the novel that I think we've had for any of our events. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get to more questions uh, for those in the audience, but if you missed any of the event uh, for any reason, we'll have it on YouTube. And uh, thank you so much to, to Lauren and Sheila and everyone who asked questions and hung out in the chat and uh, can buy a copy from Powerhouse if you haven't yet. So bye. 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 <laughs>